Good morning. Uh, I, you can say it. Good morning. There we go here. I'm Dominic. If I haven't met you uh, last week or if I didn't meet you uh, a few months ago when we were here filling in for Casey, um, my wife Hillary uh, is here as well. We're, we're so glad to, to be here and to serve and to fill in uh, while Casey's out this summer. Um, I, I work here uptown in Charlotte and then I'm part of the teaching team at our church in, in, uh, in Matthews. We're glad to be here. Uh, last week, if you were here, if you weren't here, we talked about um, the, the gospel and the implication on our money. And we remember the barn story for those of us who are here and uh, in using our money and the, the, what God has given us for something beyond ourselves. You can go download that uh, on the website if you weren't here. This week, we're going to talk about, if you hadn't guessed already... And as I said last week, I'm so thankful that Casey left me the easy topics while he's enjoying the 4th of July somewhere uh, in, in, I don't know where he is, but we get to go through these uh, incredibly important, though I think they're probably thick um, um, to subjects as well. But I'm, I'm so excited to be here, uh, so thankful to do this with you. Um, Thinking ahead, even when Casey and I were talking a couple months ago about this series and we were talking about this topic, the first thing when I think of marriage, I just think of how um, marriage is, is complicated. Whenever I attend a wedding, whenever I've done weddings, uh, I love the experience, but I'm reminded of how complicated it is. You know, for a lot of our Western culture, we basically bring two people uh, together who have spent 20 or 30 years living their own way with their own aims, their own goals, their own desires, and basically overnight say, okay, now you all have to do that together. And then we look at them and like, what's the problem? What's wrong? Why are you having issues? And we, it, it's this complicated thing that, that we bring together in union two people who have kind of lived in, in a certain way. When Hiller and I uh, first got married, I, I feel like we did a pretty good job of bringing, bringing together some of the stuff that you would normally bring together when you, when you become married, you know, possessions and money. We didn't have a lot of either, so it was, it was fairly easy there. Uh, we worked through schedule and all that stuff, but there was one uh, particular thing that just never fit, never came uh, together, uh, and that was my dog. I had a dog uh, named Tally. I got the dog actually just a few weeks before I met Hillary and we started uh, to date. Uh, here's the thing you need to know. Uh, Tally didn't like Hillary and Hillary didn't like Tally. Now that picture, um, you know, you ever see those like movies or cartoons or TV shows where like the kids are crying and everyone's mad at each other and then they smile together for the photo? That's kind of that thing. I mean, that's one of those moments where Hillary and Tally uh, were content together. This was in France and, and they got a beautiful photo. Look at that. You were saying, well, why would they not, why would she not like that gorgeous little dog, and why would that gorgeous little dog not like my beautiful wife? Um, well, here's the thing, as you can probably guess, Tally was on the scene before Hillary, and um, Tally didn't like the invasion of someone else when Hillary moved in after we got married. Hillary loves animals. It wasn't that, uh, but Hillary didn't like Tally so much, or she would say that she married into the situation um, because Tally was a bit weird. Tally had a lot of problems. Uh, Tally was maybe neurotic. Uh, Tally had separation anxiety. She would only walk uh, for me. She would only, uh, she would sit by our door. I have photos of people who have been in our, uh, was, were in our apartment while I was out at work, and then she would sit behind our door and just lay there until I got home, hours on a time. She wanted no one else around. She had, um, a variety of health issues. She got run over by a car. I mean, that's not her fault, of course, but uh, she got run over by a car, survived that, and she had multiple seizures. Whenever we went out of town, she always seemed to have a seizure with the person who was watching her. She had emergency surgery. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, and she just had kind of endless ailment after ailment after ailment. And my sweet, loving, beautiful wife ended up being the one who took care of her. Uh, and so they, they, they had this kind of love-hate relationship where they both kind of loved me but didn't really like each other uh, very much. I don't know what your thing was. If, you got, if you're married here today, maybe there's something that when you guys came together, it's like, you know what? We got this and this, this worked out all right, but this thing, it was really complicated. Marriage is complicated. 
There's a lot of ways we could even tackle this, this question, um, this whole topic, even in light of some of the more recent events. I don't know if you've heard, but in, you know, in the news, I think this topic of marriage has been a little pre- prevalent in the news lately. But as your guest this morning, um, I kind of want to go where I was planning on going a few months ago when Casey and I first talked about this. And this is uh, to a passage in the book of Ephesians. We're going to do a little bit of Bible study this morning, so you know, get your fingers ready and your mind's ready, but I want to take you to a passage in Ephesians, and it's a passage that actually is, is, is fairly controversial, and you'll see why in a second if, you, if you're not familiar with it, um, but I think if we kind of stop and, and unpack it like we're going to do today, I think it could offer um, some encouragement. I think it could offer some hope. I think it could set kind of a beacon out there um, for those of us who are married, and even if you're not married, if you're single, or maybe you're divorced, and even this topic, you're, you're thinking, how do I exit the room uh, with this amount of people in here without being seen because this is draws pain for you? Don't check out this morning just yet. Don't check out at all, but especially just yet. Don't, don't check out because even if you're not married here this morning, I think there's incredible hope for us in this. I think what, what God wants to say uh, through a passage like this, it, it, uh, it translates though we're going to talk specifically of husband and wife, also for those who are not married at this moment. So I hope we can find encouragement in that. Um, I want to take us to that text, but before we do that, would you join with me in a word of prayer? God, thank you for your incredible love that we've sung about, um, that we've articulated, that we've prayed, that we've um, expressed to one another through uh, greeting one another. Thank you for this place, and uh, what a privilege uh, to come as a guest this morning. And God, would you say what you want to say? Uh, would I not be in the way of that? And um, would you continue to build up your church, both here in this local context, around this city, and around the globe? In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to take you this morning with this kind of angle in marriage, and specifically around what am I supposed to do as a husband and what is Hillary, well, or what, is, what are you supposed to do as a wife, if you're a wife here in this room? That's kind of where I want to focus the angle this morning. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5, um, and I'm just going to go forward in one of these, in this controversial text, beginning in verse 22. But before we even read that, um, I want to give you a little bit of background, because I think it's important to understand, or at least kind of plant in your mind, what was going on at the time of this writing, at the time of the early Christian movement, as Jesus is on the scene, and as he... Um, dies and and raises to new life and ascends to heaven, this movement called the church begins to happen. What was going on in the world around them in regards to this topic of marriage? So at the time of this writing and beyond and before it as well, the world was ruled by Rome. Now there's a lot of variety of opinion uh, as far as how Romans viewed marriage, but but generally speaking, um, women were often viewed as property. Marriage was kind of a, a convenience or, or 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 an inconvenience, something as maybe that you kind of did in, in, in the aims of procreation to further the Roman Empire. Men could um, divorce a woman if they were dissatisfied or just not interested anymore. Promiscuity was very very common. Fidelity, of course, was not. In fact, when Caesar Augustus, who was the first Caesar of Rome in 18 BC, so just a few decades before Jesus comes on the scene, he goes to the Roman Senate and has a proposal for new laws that will kind of beef up uh, marriage, trying to support marriage. Now, you you think, well, that's very nice. Maybe that was the start of the Hallmark cards and all that. No, no, no. The point of it, or at least some of the point of it, was that if if more people marry, more people are going to procreate and the Roman uh, kingdom can go on. So he stands in front of the Senate, and this is part of his argument, um, he quotes an, an ancient Roman philosopher on marriage, and Augustus, Caesar Augustus says this in his support of his marriage laws. He says, if anyone could get on without a wife, Romans, we would all avoid that annoyance. But since nature has ordained that we can neither live very comfortably with them, nor at all without them, we must take thought for our lasting well-being rather than the pleasure of the moment." Very popular with the ladies, I would think. (laughs) It's an annoyance, he's saying. Hey, he's saying to these men, of course, in the Senate, he's saying, hey, we all know that marriage is an annoyance, but you know what? Can you just put aside your desire to not be married and just go ahead and get married so that we can further the Roman kingdom? That's so touching and encouraging. (laughs) 
here's, as you can imagine, the, now the early Christian movement steps into that context. And you have to imagine, you're a Roman citizen hearing this kind of thought around marriage, and then you encounter these group of people who meet together to celebrate and come around this guy, Jesus, and they say very different things about marriage. They have a very elevated view about marriage and women, for that matter. You have a group of people who value chastity, you have a group of people who, are, who see marriage as a commitment and even more so a cover, covenant, as something almost sacramental that gets certainly developed later in the Middle Ages. Marriage for the early Christians is not some capricious agreement, but is something holy, something that God has set in motion. In fact, one early Christian writer uh, said this, he said, in a Christian marriage, the couple should pray together, fast together, instruct, support, and exhort each other. Quite different than Augustus in his view of marriage. So that's the context, that's kind of the subversive view that the early Christians step into their world with, and it gets continued here in this text. What I want to do is I want to read through the text, and you're going to hear some words. If you've never heard this text before, you're going to go, all right, I don't like this already. Just hang on, we're going to unpack it uh, together. Here we go, verse, uh, chapter 5, I'm just going to read the whole thing, verses 22 to uh, 31. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, to sanctify her by cleansing her with the washing of water by the word, so that he may present the church to himself as glorious, not having a stain or wrinkle or any such blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as, as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one has ever hated his own body, but he feeds it and takes care of it, just as Christ also does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Now, the way I want to unpack this passage um, is, is this way. Paul uses a pattern to talk about the role of husbands and wives in marriage. The pattern he uses is Christ and the church. You kind of heard it there, just as Christ, just as the church. So Paul sees the relationship between Jesus and the church as a pattern for how husbands and wives should relate together. Let me give you a quick example. When uh, a few years ago in, in France, we did this children's camp and we would build it all from scratch and we had a stage, imagine this, but much longer. Um, and, and we built the stage and one year I had to replace kind of a plank probably the size of this. Uh, I had not built the stage. I don't have a, a lot of carpentry skills, skills, but I got started and the guy who built the stage who was showing me what to do, he pulled, we pulled up this plank here and he said, okay, I want you to, now I could, you know, get down there and I could look beside, you know. He said, I want you to look at the supports over here. I want you to see how this side is built. I want you to see how that side is built. And now build this, rebuild this, reinforce this stage based on what you see. He was not saying, okay, now that one's four inches. You should put a screw four inches below that one. And that one's exactly like that. He's saying, if you want to repair this piece of the stage, look at the pattern that has already been done for you. I think that's a bit of the image that Paul wants to get at here. It's like, if we're going to understand how husbands and wives should relate together, let's look at how the Christ and the church relate. So, hang with me here. We've had a good 4th of July, so I'm going to, you know, ask you to engage in this. Here we go. Ready? Four questions we're going to, we're going to unpack here out of this text. Question number one, how does the church submit to Christ? How does Christ love the church? Question number two. Question number three, that's the pattern. Question number three, how do wives submit to husbands based on that pattern, and how do husbands love, love their wives based on that pattern? So what I want to first do is talk about the pattern. Forget the husband and wife thing for now. Just park that over here. Let's just talk about what is the relationship between Christ and the church. So question number one, how does the church submit to Christ? That's what we see here in verse um, uh, verse 24, excuse me. But as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands. So the pattern there is how does the church submit to Jesus? Question number one, how does the church submit to Christ? 
Paul doesn't expound that here like he will on the second question of how Jesus loves the church. So let me offer you a couple places in Scripture where I think uh, illustrate how, how the church, how we as the church submit to Jesus. One, uh, Ephesians 1.22 says that God the Father gave Jesus to the church as its head. I think one of the ways the church submits to Jesus is taking its lead from Jesus. We as the church, you here in your local community, mine and uh, ours and, and Matthew's, us collectively, globally, we submit, the church submits to Jesus by taking our lead from him, by saying, whatever you're about, Jesus, we're about. We're following you, Jesus. Our passion is you. Now, before you jump too far to question three, just hang on. It, he's talking about something identical, not similar when he draws the comparison. So just talking about church and, and the church in Christ, the church submits to Jesus by taking its lead from Jesus, Ephesians 1.22. I think the church also submits to Jesus by leveraging the gifts that God has given to each of us in community. By leveraging our gifts, we participate in the purposes of God. I think the church submits to Jesus by leveraging, by using how God has shaped you using those gifts within the context of the church. So if we had to sum it up like this, how does the church submit to Christ? The church submits by taking her lead from Christ in the participation of the purposes of God. The church submits by taking her lead from Christ in the participation of the purposes of God. Okay, question number two. Again, just talking about the pattern. How does Christ love the church? Now this one Paul does expound on. Verse 25, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to sanctify her. Here's how Jesus loves us as the church. He sanctifies the church with the washing of water by the word so that he could present the church to himself as glorious. You know that Jesus' end goal for the church is that we would be glorious, not having a stain or wrinkle or any such blemish, but holy and blameless. Jesus loves the church by giving himself up for her. He loves the church by sacrificially giving himself for her good. Jesus loves the church by sacrificially giving himself for your good and for my good in the church. That's the pattern. So Paul says, okay, that's the pattern of relationship. Now we've got to look at that, and he says, in the same way, not in an identical way, but something similar to that, we're to understand how this thing called marriage interacts. I'm somehow supposed to understand what, how do I interact with Hillary based on that? How does Hillary interact with me? What is our calling in this world based on that pattern? So now let's get into the really uh, juicy stuff here. Question number three, now going to husbands and wives. Question number three, how does a wife submit to her husband? I know all of a sudden you're like, hang on, hang on. Can we just not use that word? Just let me kind of re, so to speak, interpret that word. Just stay with me for a second. How does a wife submit to her husband? Here's what it's not. Let me start there. Here's what I think it's not. To submit does not mean to surrender. Wives, you are to surrender to Jesus. Husbands, you are to surrender to Jesus. Children, you are to surrender to Jesus. Surrender is reserved for Christ, not your spouse. It does not mean surrender. I also don't think it means to be voiceless or anonymous. Often it gets couched in that terms, and here we go. You just want me to be, you know, over here in the corner and not say anything. I don't think it's that either. Here's what I think it means based on the pattern of the church submitting to Christ. I think it means that a wife joins with her husband in the purposes of God. A wife joins with her husband in the purposes of God. She leverages, uses the gifts that God has given her in joining with her husband and together they participate in the purposes of God. I think a wife in this vein says to her husband, you know what, I'm going to follow you. Not because I'm incapable of, of following God on my own. It's not that. But God has brought us together in marriage. And I just want you to know, I was following Jesus before you showed up on the scene. I got married. None of that changed. I'm still following Jesus. Now God has brought us together as husband and wife, and I'm still going to be following Jesus. Now I'm bringing you into this, and we're going forward after Jesus together. 
I think that's what he's getting at. I think it's a wife who says, you know what, my primary devotion has been, is, and always will be Jesus. Now you're here, okay, that's good, but you need to know I'm going after Jesus. But I'm choosing to do it linked with you. You say that in the car when you get out of here in a few minutes, your husband's going to go, oh, okay. <laughs> I, think, I think that does something. I think that does something if, if that's kind of the, the, the pattern you live. I think that says um, to, to anyone who will listen that your first passion is Jesus. And that's how it should be. Your first passion is Jesus. And I think it also says to your husband, hey buddy, I don't know if you'd call your husband buddy, maybe you don't, but hey buddy, I just want you to know I'm going to be following Jesus because that's always what I've done. That's my destiny. That's what I'm going to do with my whole life. Now you're in the scene, you're in the car, you're in the house. That's fine. I love you. We're together, but you need to know I'm following Jesus. And I think that exhorts the husband to say, you better get on board. I think that's a beautiful challenge to us as husbands. I think to sum that all up, I think a wife submits to her husband by joining with her husband, by using all of her gifts and leveraging her passion for Jesus in what God is doing in the world. It's not separate. It doesn't mean she can't do it separate. Hillary does things uh, and, and does uh, things in ministry that I absolutely love that I'm, I don't participate in. But we're in that together. We've joined in that. I celebrate that. I love telling people about what she does in ministry and the influence she has. How does a wife submit to her husband by joining with her husband, leveraging all of her gifts and abilities in the participation of the purposes of God? Question four, how does the husband love his wife? Guys, is for us. Think we as husbands love our wives, looking at the pattern of Jesus in the church, by sacrificially laboring for her good. Your role as husbands, my role as husbands, I can say this more boldly because I am a husband, you, my, my purpose, my aim, my role in this deal is to labor and strive for Hillary's good. You may say, what is the, the best thing, the good thing for Hillary? What is the good thing for your wife? Guess what? The best thing for your wife is that she would know Jesus and that she would leverage her passions and abilities and gifts in the purposes of God in this world. Husbands, the best way you could love your wife Get some flowers, you gotta do that. The gifts, you gotta do that. Clean up around the house, you gotta do that. Take out the trash. I'll do it, I promise. Um, well, you gotta do all those things for sure, but the best thing you could possibly do is spend your energy so that your wife would fall more in love with Jesus and use everything that God has given her for the purposes of, her, of God in this world. Now, can you imagine what happens? Can you imagine the couple that leaves this room and sits in the car and gets in the car and, and the wife says, you know, hey, before we start the car, I just want to tell you that I'm passionate for Jesus. We're joined together in marriage. I just want you to know I've been passionate for Jesus before you came along. I'm passionate for Jesus now. I'm going to be participating in what he's calling us to do. Uh, I'm just, I'm telling you that and I'm joining with you. Let's go. And right after she finishes talking, because husbands wait for their wives to finish talking, and we listen well. So after she finishes talking, the husband says, well, you know, that's very interesting because um, my passion is Jesus. And my passion for you is that you would fall more in love with Jesus. And my passion for us as a couple is that we would participate in where God is calling us together to live and move and carry out the purposes of God. It's a beautiful convergence of service when that happens. In fact, if I had to put a word on today, if I had to put a word on marriage that you're just like, I, I lost you on question four, whatever, he here's the word for you to take away today. Out serve. Marriage is an is a, is a interaction of two people working to out serve one another. It's two people who, who individually are, are caught up in God's love for them and they're, they're finding a way to respond to that. And then when that comes together, it's almost like a combustion of, of two people who say, you know what, I'm passionate for Jesus. I wanna be passionate for Jesus. Great, we're together. Um, we could do amazing things together. 
Marriage, if I had to put one word on it, to outserve one another. One phrase. My hope and my challenge for you is that you would outserve your spouse. That you would find ways that together you would leverage all that God has given you in his purposes in this world. Here's the interesting thing, though. All of that starts with you and Jesus. You can go to all the marriage classes you want. You can you know, read all the books you want. You can go to all the websites. You can say, well, you know what? I've been in relationship after relationship. I've done this. I kind of got this thing down. We're okay. All of that, though, starts with Jesus. All of that starts with you in Jesus. Marriage starts with you individually in Jesus. When you get married, you, doesn't, don't, you don't go away. It's two people coming together. You come with your passions and your gifts and your abilities. And the first thing, the base of that, is you and your relationship with God through Jesus. The gospel says that sin has separated us from God. That the God who created us, the God who created this thing called marriage, the God who stirs in us for us to know him, that got turned upside down. And the gospel begins to turn that right side up and offers for us forgiveness of sin. Offers us the first relationship we really need to deal with before we deal with marriage, before we deal with anything like that, is we deal with our relationship with God. The start of marriage is starting with Jesus. So maybe next to the outserve piece, maybe you need to hear this morning um, God calling you to engage that first relationship with Jesus. Because you know what? I'm not going to love Hillary as I should unless I understand my relationship with Jesus and his relationship to me. She's not going to live as a wife as God's calling her to live until she engages with God on her own. Power of marriage is going to happen when you and I first interact with Jesus and respond to his call of relationship with him. As the band comes back up now, um, I just want to give us a word of encouragement. I, for some of us in this room, some are married. Maybe you've come in here uh, full of energy and life. Maybe marriage for you is going incredibly well. Maybe you say, you know what, this is, this is amazing to hear this, to open God's word because that's exactly where we are and, and we're just moving along the way and that's fantastic. I just encourage you and support you. But I know enough having been in ministry for the amount of time I've been in ministry. I know enough from having friends who are married that a lot of times marriage doesn't look like that. And you can maybe hear this and kind of go, great, another failure. I hope you don't. I hope you hear a God who's kind of setting a beacon out there, who's calling you in gentleness and love to him. I hope you hear a God who values and cares for your marriage deeply. Of all the junk and the mess and everything that may have happened that you've brought into this room, that in his gentleness and care, he cares deeply for you and for your marriage. And here's the thing, the very, very best thing you could do is not leave here with a checklist. The very best thing you could do is come face to face again with your Savior. Of the God who created marriage, of the God who calls you passionately first to him and to that relationship. And you may be in this room and, and maybe you're not married. Maybe you're single, maybe marriage, maybe you're divorced and marriage it creates a lot of pain for you, even talking about the subject. Mm. Well, here's the thing about this, and here's why I didn't want you to check out earlier. Whether you're single or married, the call is the same. We're to follow Jesus. We're to respond to his passionate love for us with our response of passion for him. Your first call as a single person is to know Jesus and to make him known. Your first call as a divorced person is to know Jesus and make him known. Your first call when you get married is to know Jesus and make him known. None of that changes at the wedding altar. 
Our first call, all of us in this room, is to know Jesus and make him known. And there, again, there may be a lot of pain. I was single for uh, six years. I, I, I feel like I, couldn't get, I didn't get a date for, as, not, not for lack of trying, but I just couldn't get anything. And I was wondering, I was like wrestling with this God right after college for that, those years. And, and it was hard. And if you've been there, maybe you're there right now as a single person, you know that that's a, that's a struggle that, that few people really get unless you've been there. And that may create, again, a lot of pain for you, but here's the deal. I think if you spend your life in passionate pursuit of Jesus in response to his passion for you, I don't think you'll ever look back on that with regret. I don't think you'll ever go, you know what, those four years that I was single, what a waste. I just went after Jesus with my entire life. That was a waste. No, it won't be. You've had a marriage breakup. You've had pain in marriage. And you say, you know what? I'm just going to spend these next years following Jesus as passionately as I can and receiving his healing. That's not going to be a waste. That's where life is found. The call for all of us in this room, no matter your marriage status here today, is to know Jesus and make him known in this world. And my hope for you is that you would hear his gentleness, you would hear the passion of his love, that as he leads us to the very place where we need to start, to the cross, that we would find where marriage begins, where singleness takes, takes life, where divorced life finds healing, all of that starts at the cross with Jesus. God, we thank you for your incredible love. And even as we sing this song, as we close here, God, that you would remind us of your passion for us. That those in this room who are married, God, that we would leverage our lives, um, just like we said last week, for something beyond ourselves, that we would respond in passion and to your passion for us and to spend ourselves for the good of one another and your purposes in this world. For those who are not married in this room, God, that you would further and deepen their passion for you. For all of us, God, that we would start with you in your call at the cross to us. Savior, I come, quiet my soul. Remember, redemption's hill where your blood was spilled. Lord, leave.
the cross. 